can I admit the participants? No. No. Yeah, okay, great. So I'm admitting all people are trickling in, yeah. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Welcome to the third and last day of Power Skills 2021. The next level free virtual career summit with the stories of resilience, reinvention and reskilling hosted by Career Advice and Transition Services at McGill School of Continuing Studies. My name is Diana Viola, um, Communications Associate at CATS. And in this call, I have my colleague, Emily Salvi, you say hi. Hi, welcome everyone. And I want to introduce you to our facilitator today in this session. Uh, her name is Iris Papaimano. She is fellowship assistant at McGill Writing Center. Uh, so thank you, Diana, for my introduction. And I'm going to uh, introduce you immediately for the reason that you're here, who is uh, Zachary Abram and the session uh, that is about to begin. So Zach uh, earned his PhD in English at the University of Ottawa in 2016. Uh, his written work has been published extensively and he has been invited to speak about writing and literature around the world. He has taught writing at the post-secondary level since uh, 2011. And in 2018 was the recipient of McGill's Award for Distinguished Teaching. So with that, uh, take it away, Zach. Thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction, uh, Iris. And, and thanks very much to uh, Deanna and, uh, and Emily for, uh, for inviting me. And indeed, uh, thanks very much for the invitation to the whole uh, SES uh, CATS uh, team. So uh, today's workshop is devoted to persuasion, right? How we can through the written word, affect change in others, inspire action, and make people actually respond to those emails uh, and actually do what we ask of them and uh, do those favors we want uh, using just uh, the written word, right? And uh, I think, it, I'm sure you know and you would agree with me that it, that is one of the hardest things to do is to uh, you know, really make someone affect change, inspire action, and do something uh, with just your words, with just the written word, with nothing else, right? Um, and it is sometimes easier when you're in person, of course, because there's lots of things you can do in person that you can't do just over an email or, or in a text. So what I'm gonna do today, hopefully, is give you some concrete, actionable strategies you can use uh, in your writing to um, make sure that you are um, putting yourself, you're putting your best foot forward, as it were, putting your best, um, your, your best words forward so that you can uh, persuade your, your readers and be a more effective uh, communicator. So the way the workshop is gonna work uh, today is I'll be giving a presentation, uh, but throughout the presentation, I might be asking questions uh, and I would encourage you uh, to respond to those questions in the chat, or if you feel comfortable, you can raise your hand on Zoom and uh, speak uh, uh, to me orally. So uh, if at any point a question occurs to you uh, while, while I'm talking, please feel free to uh, raise your hand and I'll try to get back to you to answer it. So this isn't gonna be one of those uh, sessions where I just speak uh, at my computer for, for 90 minutes. No, I'm hoping that it'll be a bit more interactive than that. And there's gonna be a couple of activities uh, along uh, the way. So what I wanna do uh, right away is to put a handout in uh, the chat, if I can. Uh, and um, having some difficulty here. Let's see, there we go. But so I put a, uh, a handout in the chat. So if you want to download that uh, right away, uh, please feel free to do so. It'll also be up on the screen, but it might be easier if you have it on your, um, on your computer as well, if you can. So take a look at that and I'll be referring to that throughout uh, the session. So I'm just gonna start sharing my screen now and uh, we will get uh, going. So, um, Emily or Deanna, it says that uh, the uh, host has disabled screen sharing. So perhaps you could make me a, a host or co-host and then I can uh, share my screen. Absolutely. All right, thanks very much. Okay. So uh, first and foremost, I have to thank uh, 
the the SES Cats team for putting together this poster. I don't think I've ever looked as good as I do in this poster. It's it's, it's quite amazing. I, I I barely recognize myself in this uh, in, in, in this in this poster. So here we are: the art of persuasion, becoming a more persuasive writer. So. Here's me, I'm Dr. Zachary Abram, but please throughout the session, uh, and, and if ever we, we, we shall meet again, please feel free to call me Zach, uh, if, if that's too informal for you, but Professor Abram is fine, but please, Zach is totally fine. And uh, wh wh where I wanna start with is talk about one of the reasons why writing persuasively is so difficult, right? Why, why it is such a, um, such a hard thing to achieve, why it is, uh, you know, why it sometimes feels like a Herculean task and part of it is just that we have so much stuff to do, right? I don't know about you, but it, it has felt that way, even as, uh, especially during this uh, pandemic, that our email inboxes are overflowing. We have so much to respond to. We have so much to read. And it makes, uh, you know, the idea of sending an email, asking someone to do something, to, to, to do you a favor, to contribute uh, to their workload in some way, that just seems like, uh, so it, it, it seems borderline rude. So part of the problem is that we just have so much in our inbox. So I've got a couple of questions up on the, uh, the board right now asking you how many emails do you think are sent each day worldwide? So think about that for one moment. How many emails do you think are sent each day worldwide? And maybe answer in the chat uh, with, your, uh, with your best guess. How many emails do you think are sent? Millions, yeah, okay. I think we can say it's millions. A billion, a trillion, okay, a trillion, billions. All right, so I think you, you, you I think I, I, I'm starting to get trillions, trillions, 25 billion. Interesting, interesting uh, guests, um, guesses. I'm getting the sense that a lot of you have, uh, have tough inboxes you have to, uh, to cut through on, on a daily basis. So just a, a side question then, how many emails do you think the average person receives per day? How many emails do you think the average person receives per day? Think about your own life. How many emails would you say you get per day? 50, 75? So a lot of people are guessing 50, 75. Okay, you guys are mostly right on that account. So six, it's a bit higher than six, I think. I wish, oh my God, I wish. So the, the, the actual answer is based on recent, uh, recent data says that there are about 205.6 billion emails sent every day, right? And the vast majority of those emails are business related. Right, they are in some. They, they are kind of commercial um, emails. They are spam, perhaps, but nonetheless, they clog up our inbox. Two hundred and five point six billion, and the average person receives about eighty-five emails per day. Right, so most of you were pretty uh, pretty close uh, on that one. Right, and keep in mind, people have more. I'm sure all of you have more than one uh, email address. So if you add up all those email addresses, even the ones you don't check, even even the ones from um, you know when you were a kid and you, you and you you were just applying to university and you made your own Hotmail account, you know, cool guy, 1985 at hotmail.com. Those that still counts, right? Those are, that 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 address is still getting emails. So that think about the absolute fatigue that your um, that, that your interlocutor, that your correspondent is getting every day, right? So it's hard to persuade them when every email, every message that you get is a kind of burden, right? So we're not just talking about emails today. We're gonna to be talking about all sorts of different types of writing because sometimes you will have to, of course, um, you know, write a report and maybe even essays uh, and, and provide um, evaluations and, and recommendations. All those things fall under the bracket of persuasive writing as well but often it takes the form of that email and just the idea of, of contributing to that big stack of 200.5, 205.6 billion emails per day. Uh, it, we're already kind of behind the eight ball. We're already um, a little bit, um, a, a little bit, uh, you know, working from behind because people, you know, how many of you, when you hear that, ding, or that nice chime in Outlook when you get an email, how many, well, what's your reaction? Is it, Ooh, yay, another email, or is it, Oh God, what, what fresh, what fresh hell awaits me in this in the in, in this next email, right? Uh, <clears throat> so that is uh, that is what we have to think about as we are trying to trying to um, overcome these obstacles, right? Um, so just sorry, Zach. Just go before ahead. Um, you go on, would you be able to reshare your document um, because someone uh, joined a little bit later than when you posted? Yeah, sure. It uh, in the chat. Thanks a lot. I will try to post it again in the chat. 
So it should be there in a bit. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, one thing that I, 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 I want to stress is that persuasive writing is not too different from any other type of writing. And uh, at the Writing Center, we, we like to um, gesture towards and, and mention this theoretical framework, which is called APOS, right? A-P-O-S, it's an initialism. It stands for audience, purpose, organization, and style. And what a lot of good writers do is when they are composing a document, whether it's an email, whether it's uh, a report, whether it's an essay, no matter, no matter what the genre, you want to uh, pay attention to these four cornerstones. These are kind of the four criteria by which uh, writing tends to be effective or, or, or less effective, right? So th this isn't really a strategy so much as it is a, a theoretical framework. It's, these are just kind of, th these are four things these are the most important four things you want to have in the back of your mind as you are uh, writing, as you're composing, as you're researching, as you're editing, no matter what, these are the things you want to be um, to have in, in the back of your mind. They are kind of like the lighthouse to your uh, ship as you are, uh, you know, if I can belabor a metaphor, if you're, you're if, when you're out to sea and you're trying to write, these are this, this, these, these four things are your guide. They're your lighthouse. So the A in APOS stands for audience. And I'm sure this is something that's intuitive to you. There are lots of different factors that can uh, change how you write based on your audience, right? So you have to tailor your, um, your text, your, your writing to your audience. And you have to ask yourself a number of questions, right? Who am I communicating with? And crucially, what is their level of knowledge and what is their level of interest, right? So sometimes it's the case, like say, if you're asking for a favor, if you're trying to be persuasive, that you know this person is really interested in this, um, in this subject, in this topic. And so it's relatively easy to get them to uh, be on your side because they're heavily interested. But often it's the case that you're asking someone a favor about something they're not really that interested in. You really are just creating extra work for them. So if that's the case, you have to do a little bit more work. And by the same token, uh, sometimes you might be writing to someone who doesn't have the same level of knowledge that you do about a particular project, about a particular um, aspect of, of your work life or, or your school life. And so you have to bring them up to speed. So you have to, you know, I think probably many of you have had the experience of uh, someone writing to you with an immense amount of jargon, with terms and terminology that you just don't understand and you're not even interested in. And then they're asking something of you and it's, it's, it, you're less likely to reply or less likely to do it simply because the table has not been set for you to respond in a positive way. So we'll talk about ways in this uh, workshop, hopefully, uh, to, to overcome that possible stumbling block. So when it comes to audience, you want to um, pay attention to their knowledge, their attitudes, and their needs. What do they know? What do they need to know? And what is their general attitude towards the topic at hand? Now, in P, the P in APOS stands for purpose. In that case, um, you know, most uh, writing, whether it's academic or whether it's professional, tends to have two purposes, right? There can be other writing that's to entertain or, or to make someone laugh. But it, at, it, at work in school, the purpose tends to either be to inform or to persuade. So think about the, um, the types of, of writing that uh, you typically do on a day-to-day -day basis, are you usually informing or are you usually persuading? I would say even when you are writing an informative email, you, there's, a, there's, a, there's an element of persuasion there, right? And, the, and even the persuasion might even very well be just to read that email or just to read that message or to read that report, to, to hook, to, uh, to have the audience's attention. So that is uh, something we need to consider, right? Uh, what is harder to write? to be persuasive or to be informative. It's definitely harder to be persuasive, isn't it? Simply because it requires a lot more writing and you have to actually, you're not just telling someone what to think, you're not just filling them in, you're actually trying to change how they think. Now the O in organization, in, in APOS stands for organization, which is to say how the material should be presented, right? In what order? Should it be chronological? Should I speak directly? Should I speak indirectly? All those things are um, decisions that writers have to make having to do with genre, right? The organization of your piece is so important, how you present the material. So we're going to talk about in this workshop ways in which the material can be presented that is more effective. Then the S is 
style, right? And that when I say style, I don't necessarily mean if you're writing poetic verse or if you're writing the, 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 this, this florid language, this amazing uh, eloquence. It's not that, right? It's about if you're writing in a style that is in keeping with the rest of your, of, of, with the rest of the criteria, the audience and the purpose of, in the organization. Now, I know you don't write in the same style to your boss as you do to your best friend or to your mom or as you do to your partner, right? There's a different tone based on your audience, right? So should, should can I use abbreviations? Can I use jargon? What pronouns should I be deploying? Uh, what should be the formatting? All those things fall under the category of style. So uh, go ahead. There's a question from uh, Lorraine on the P of the APOS. Sure. Um, she's asking, where does consulting fall? Would it be so, persuading someone to give time to give their opinion? Or do you have a, anything to say about that? I, well, it depends on, on the writing context, I think. Uh, when you are consulting, Lorraine, sometimes it, it can feel like, informative. But often, uh, con consultants are, are always kind of trying to sell themselves. They are, in, in a sense, that writing is, is almost always uh, persuasive. So I, I think it's often the case when uh, you're consulting with someone on a, um, on a project or anything like that, it's likely that you're trying to change a culture, you're trying to change a, an operation, you're trying to change the way in which a particular as workflow aspect is, um, is, do is um, we're consulting to, to better guide projects. Is like a board, yeah. So I think you know you, the word is right there in the chat to better guide the project. You're trying to kind of improve it. In that sense, it, it comes out to be persuasive. But I'll show you what I mean as we um, as we move along. So let's take a look at this email. So this is in the um, <clears throat> uh, first activity that the on on the handout that I shared. Uh, you can see it there, and you can also see it on the screen here. Uh, so I'm, he I'm hearing some uh, some sound. So if someone could, if you can mute yourself, that'd be great. Um, the it says here. Let, let's take a look at this email together. Now, this email is being sent from Human Resources, and it is uh, advertising to a certain extent upcoming workshops. And it might seem informative. But uh, I think if we read it, we can detect a level of persuasion. And there are certain choices that are made that help, um, um, that help create that persuasion, help create, create that persuasive effect. So here we go. Dear community member, our human resource unit offers professional development opportunities to support community members in meeting personal goals. Our unit's focus is hiring strategies, engaging employees, and planning benefits and compensation. Please check out our dynamic, our upcoming dynamic HR workshop series and register for the workshops that best suit your, your needs. Space is limited. And they have a list of all the uh, different workshops that are upcoming. Stay tuned for the uh, additional workshops in the fall term. These opportunities will be announced as the dates are confirmed. Best regards, the HR development team. So what I'd like you to do for just a, a couple minutes is take a look at this, uh, at this message and ask yourself where APOS is coming into play, right? So as I just said, APOS refers to audience, purpose, organization, and style. And if we look through this uh, message, you can see that the um, author of this uh, message, that the writer of this message is deploying APOS throughout, the, um, throughout the, the email. So if you look even in the salutation, dear community member, that is, audience and style, right? It is, the, the writer is paying heed to that particular audience. So think about it, right? Uh, imagine if the uh, email was dear employees or dear faceless workers, <laughs> dear unwashed masses, right? That would not be in keeping with audience or style, right? So dear community member, it points to the fact that, that they are treating you as a member of a community, that it's inclusive, that the choice of that language speaks to audience and style. So just for a minute, Please take a look at this message and point out in the chat, or uh, we can say later when we reconvene, point out where you think APOS is at play. So I'll, I'll reshare that in a second. But uh, what I'm asking is just take a look at that first activity and please try to identify on the handout or, or in your mind at least, where APOS is at work in that message.
So we will reconvene in about two minutes. So Zach, there's been a request, if you don't mind, to reshare the APOS graphic. Thanks. Yep. Okay, so I know it's just been a short time, but uh, I was uh, wondering uh, what you might have thought of that message. Where is APOS in play? So Deborah says everywhere, right? And that, that is true, right? It, almost every choice that the writer makes in some way pays heed to the, uh, the, the principles of the cornerstones of APOS. Right? Fab points to purpose, right? And you want to ask yourself, what is the uh, purpose of this message? Well, it might seem informative, but I think there is kind of an implied persuasion, isn't there? And what are they trying to persuade their readers of? Well, that you should attend these workshops. It's not just that they are available, but there's a kind of hint, right? It's not a strong implication, but it, there is a, a, a hint to where it should be, um, to that you should be going to these messages, right? So Jaquetta points out to the, the, the hyperlinks and the workshop titles, right? We can see that they are in bold. We can see that, that they are, um, th th that this person cho chose not to include all these massive URLs, right? But rather chose to deploy hyperlinks. And that's, that speaks to um, organization and to style, right? Right. So uh, Everett says it might be better if they would, uh, uh, you know, say what, what the benefit is to them, but it's true. Perhaps they're just trying to keep the persuasion at, at a subtle level. So it has that chronological um, uh, organization as well, right? It goes throughout the months of December, uh, of November into December. And like, like Audrey points out, space is limited. That is style, right? Inform, persuade, all those things are there. So I think all of the um, all of the things you're pointing out in the chat, Catherine, are are, are quite right, right? Um, so if we take a look, I kind of tried to point out every instance that I could see where APOS was being used, kind of to be persuasive, right? So I think often we think of persuasion as being this thing where we kind of have to hammer people over the head with um, "you should do this, you should do that," uh, that this is my recommendation, this is my evidence, but often persuasion functions just at a, at a very low level, at a very subtle, discrete level, using uh, the thing like, um, like APOS, using a, a framework like APOS. So if we look here, I put it all out, right? The purpose is, is indicated in the subject of the uh, workshops are upcoming, the community member, right? Um, <clears throat> our unit is focused in engaging employees and planning benefits and compensation. It's all there. Uh, the, the space is limited, as someone pointed out, that speaks to style, right? Doesn't that, in a certain sense, say that space is limited? We ought to, uh, you ought to sign up right away. And then we have the chronological hyperlinks and bolds of the dates and the titles. All those things speak to organization. And at the very end, best regards from the HR development team. Right? It's not, you know, 
uh, uh, the, the, it's not like there's no, no sign off and it doesn't come from a particular person, but rather indicates that it's a whole team experience, right? So what I was trying to, what I'm trying to convey to you with this example is that there is so much you can do uh, to put yourself in a better, um, a better uh, position to persuade your correspondent if you make, if you, if you make these choices in adherence with, with APOS, right? And I'm not saying that um, this email is a perfect email, right? Uh, it, 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 there's probably opportunities to be, uh, to, to, there's, lots of, there's, pro there's probably many opportunities to improve it. And like, like Sally says in the chat, there's a bit of a disconnect between the style and the words used. So perhaps that could be, that could be bridged. But what I think this email does well uh, from a persuasive point of view is that it, there isn't a lot of noise, right? There isn't a lot of, there aren't a lot of issues. It's, it, it, it pays perfect, maybe not perfect, but it pays at least adequate um, uh, adherence to audience purpose, organization, and style. Those things tend to be working together. They tend to be working in tandem. And it's not as though they are at, at, at odds, right? So did anyone have any other comments about uh, this example that, that came to mind if they want to share? Sally? Yeah, I was going to um, say that one of the things that I was thinking about was I was the recipient of this. Like from, from an organizational administrative perspective, this is an awesome email. It's all the boxes that you're talking about. But with, for me reading it, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, oh, really? I have now helped um, influence um, compensation strategies. Okay. And you're calling me capital management? You and capital management? Yeah. So we're having trouble. We're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Uh, but I think I, I get your, um, your, 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 the, the main point of your comment, which is that there, there are perhaps some red flags that, that uh, come up with in, in a kind of business speak that, are, um, that, that, that rub you the wrong way. And I, I can totally understand that. Uh, I would just, I think uh, what one would hope that it's part of a, uh, a company culture where it would be, where, where that kind of thing could be mitigated. But I totally take your point, uh, Sally, and I'm sorry we couldn't hear you uh, well, but uh, if you want to put your, your comment in the chat, please, please feel free to. Okay, so I'm just going to um, move on uh, from that, but I would just encourage you as we go through the rest of the workshop, and when you're writing after this, please, uh, you know, please keep APOS uh, in mind. So what I think Sally was maybe uh, referencing a little bit uh, a moment ago is the, uh, the, the, the difficulty of tone, right? Uh, and it is just a fact that when people receive written work, uh, whether it's in text, whether it's an email, whether it's a report, they have a hard time gauging what the tone is. Uh, and it's not just that, the, the difficulty is that people, readers, when they get a piece of written work, they always interpret it to be um, more negative than the sender intends, right? And I'm sure you've probably been in that position before where you write what you think is a relatively innocuous uh, message or you write a relatively innocuous um, text and, and you give it to someone and they interpret into it uh, a, a lot of negativity, right? They interpret it. They 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 interpret your tone as being negative, even if you didn't intend it. And this is something that, as writers, is very hard for us to overcome, right? So tone refers to how writers express their attitude toward themselves, their topic, the person to whom they are writing, and this can be very fraught, right? I'm sure you've been in many situations where you've texted a friend, "Oh, do you want to grab pizza later?" and they write back, "No." And you think, huh, that seems a little bit standoffish, but maybe the person doesn't mean that at all. Maybe it's like, no, right? The difficulty is that we can't always interpret emotion in our texts, right? I'm seeing a lot in the, uh, in the chat. I'll get to that in a moment. But one thing I wanted to bring your attention to that really has a massive effect on persuasive writing is what determines meaning in communication, right? They've done studies on this, and uh, it might surprise you to learn that the words you use are not that important <laughs> in, in the long run. Really, they're not, right? When you're speaking to someone in person or you can see them even over Zoom, it helps a little bit. Uh, what determines meaning is actually determined by body language and vocal inflection. By far, the things that determine meaning the most are body language and vocal inflection, but the words help a little bit but they're not the most important thing. 
So I think you understand that the difficulty then in, in becoming a persuasive writer, uh, the, uh, the issue is when you're writing, you, don't you can't lean on those crutches, right? You can't lean on the crutch of body language and vocal inflection, right? Imagine if instead of uh, seeing this, uh, uh, imagine it, it, in, instead of seeing this presentation from me, instead you got a, just a transcript, right? What would that experience be like? It would be a bit alienating, wouldn't it? Because you, would, you wouldn't be able to see, you know, my, my body language. I'm someone who talks with their hands so much, right? You, you can probably even see it in, o, o, over Zoom and you can't tell my, my vocal inflection, which speaks to emphasis. So what writers have to do, unfortunately, is what, right? Write tone into their texts, right? Write emotions into their text. So how do we do that? So I'll show you what I mean about um, how words aren't as important as we tend to think they are, right? So look at this sentence. I didn't kill Richard, right? What does that mean? What does that sentence mean? Well, it has many possible meanings, actually. It's just four words, but it actually has about three different meanings depending on vocal inflection and emphasis, right? So if I said, I didn't kill Richard, what do you know for sure? Well, I, I killed someone, but not Richard. If I say, I didn't kill Richard, well, you know, uh, I didn't kill him, but I, perhaps I, I, I maimed him. Perhaps I, I injured him gravely, but I didn't kill him. I didn't kill Richard. We know that Richard is dead, but I did not kill him. Perhaps I killed his deputy, right? This is, um, th this is what I'm trying to say about how vocal inflection and body language are so much more important than the words in in in-person communication. We we kind of interpret it totally um, subconsciously, and so it, in some cases, in some readings of this sentence, Richard is uh, alive. In some cases, he's dead, and in some cases, I killed him, and sometimes I didn't. Right? Vastly opposite uh, interpretations, vastly opposite meanings, but it all uh, it all makes sense to those who can um, comprehend body language and vocal inflection. Sorry, my screen has frozen. And there, Go ahead. Someone, someone also added um, another possible interpretation. Um, uh, Lorraine Fontaine again said, I didn't kill Richard, yeah. indicating that you're speaking to, to Richard. That's but, right. Yeah, so there's all <laughs> sorts of ways. Exactly. There's, there's, there's lots of different ways in which um, the, the things that we can't exactly control uh, totally end up um, changing the meaning of our sentences, right? Uh, so how can we, there, there are certain structures that I'm going to try to point you to that can help us uh, alleviate this issue. But generally speaking, we have to be aware that our, um, our words may be misinterpreted as a result of just the, the very phenomenon I'm discussing, right? And that, this is why we invented emojis, right? This is, why, this is why we have so many emojis in our phones. I, I, I was looking the other day and in, on, your, on your iPhone, I, there are th I think there are three different emojis for gondolas, right? Uh, I can't imagine ever using one, but hey, there's three at our disposal. And I think in, in 2015 or 2016, Oxford Dictionaries named the emoji that's on the screen, the, the laughing and crying emoji as the word of the year. Why did we invent these emojis? Because we can't, because text and writing is a toneless medium. The emotions that are there are brought there by the reader, not as much by the writer. And so we include these emojis just so people can just, to, it's a little bit of a crutch, right? Just to give people an idea of what our emotion is while we are writing that, what we are writing. And so when someone says, do you want to go for pizza later? And you write back, no smiley face or tongue out face, you know that you're sending the message to your friend that they shouldn't take this too seriously, that this isn't, uh, this isn't their, their friendship isn't over as a result of this text exchange. <clears throat> but all that said, even though writing is a, a, a toneless medium, you want to make care to, you want to take care to insert tone with the words you choose. You can do this at a number of levels. Uh, so don't give in to empty professional sounding voice, right? I think there, there is a kind of corporate speak, a kind of business language that kind of predominates in a lot of uh, communication in, in business. And it, 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 it kind of sucks the life out of writing. And it actually, it, it isn't as effective as people think it is, right? You, you might avoid some possible emotional misunderstandings, uh, but on the whole, it makes uh, our communications much more robotic and less, um, less effective. 
And especially it's the case when we are doing persuasive writing, emotion has to come into it, right? For informative writing, uh, perhaps uh, it's not so bad to, um, to, 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 to just, just put it all on the page with just the facts man kind of situation. But when we're being persuasive, we have to manage our audience's emotions. And that's a lot of what we do. So these um, communication scholars, Shannon and Weaver, they came up with this um, transmission model of communication, right? Which suggests that in every communication, no matter what, whether it's an email, whether it's a phone call, whether it's an in-person conversation, there is a sender, there is a message and a medium by which that message is delivered, and then there is a receiver. And what you want as much as possible is to be making eye contact in between the sender and the receiver, to make eye contact with your writer, with your writing. Imagine your audience, imagine a real person on the other end of your correspondence, and try as best you can to look them in the eye. What gets in the way of uh, communication is if there is noise, right? If there is noise in um, in, in, the, in, the, in the communication, right? If the, you're, you're, the sender is delivering the message, but for whatever reason, the receiver can't hear it, right? So in an in-person conversation, the noise that disrupts communication might very well be actual noise, right? I live in Montreal, and e even during this uh, pandemic, all I, I still hear uh, jackhammers whenever I'm outside, and, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm often woken up to the dulcet tones of a jackhammer at 7 a.m. every morning. And in that case, literal noise is getting in the way of our communication. Can you think of any examples where um, noise, uh, what would you describe as noise in a, um, in a writing situation, in a, in a, in a correspondence? What, what, what constitutes and what, what, what counts as noise in, a, in, in writing? If something is irrelevant. Right, if there's this, if there's this bloat, right? It's kind of like what Lisa and other people are saying, too many items, surplus of words that add no value. I think we've all kind of been there where, you know, so someone writes you a message and they've you know, included a paragraph detailing their, their, their latest issues with their child or something. And they're like, just get, get, to, the, uh, get to the point, please, right? Uh, and so what you, what you want to avoid is you want to cut the small talk. You don't want uh, your reader to be hacking through a forest with a, with a machete of words to get to your main point. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to seem abrupt either. Uh, any other ideas? Repetition, emojis, yeah, that, uh, you know, I use that emoji example, but I neglected to say that in most business scenarios, we can't rely on them, right? We can't use them, uh, so we have to find ways to include emotion without, without them. Mistrust, yes. Uh, poor set, yeah. I was uh, that. That's a good example, right? From from Sonia, uh, poor poor sentence structure, poor grammar. These things aren't the worst things in the world, but they do constitute noise. If if your um, reader has to make a lot of uh, interpret in, has to interpret a lot as they're reading your your text, that is a problem. And, and um, let's see. Catherine says, you know, attachments that don't that you, that you don't need to open that you need to open, or maybe an enormous attachments. All sorts of things can constitute noise. So what you want to be, uh, all the things you're putting in the chat is good, right? What 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 the writer wants to say, yeah, font pack, all those things are true, right? A acronyms, you know, all those things are, are 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 noise, right? They get in the way of your meaning. Sometimes you can't avoid them, but what you want to do is be aware of the noise in your writing, and as as best you can, see if you can eliminate it. Uh, so that you're, all you're getting is just a clear message from sender to receiver in the, um, uh, through, through, through the channel that you've chosen, right? And, uh, you know, a lot, some of you have pointed about acronyms and you pointed out jargon. Jargon uh, is, that means like specialized business speak, speak that people only, that the people only in an organization would know. And that happened to me when I you know, went to McGill. I, uh, uh, I, I, in my first, you know, few months in McGill, I was, I would, I would ask people questions, and uh, they would say, "Oh yeah, we'll just go to OSD uh, down at the NYU, and you find the a a APB." And I'm like, "Okay, I, I don't know what any of that, any, any of that means," um, and but you eventually you do find out. But jargon in, in in a business context, in a communication context, it serves the same um, purpose as slang, right? Jargon and slang are kind of the same. They are meant to indicate in groups and out groups, right? So if if you if someone knows particular slang, maybe in, in where you are, there there are particular slang that immediately uh, 
tell people who uh, indicate if you are from a particular area, right? I'm from Toronto. And sometimes I'll hear people say, oh yes, I am also from Toronto. And I know immediately, no, you're not, right? Because no one from Toronto would say Toronto. That, sec that second T is silent. And what jargon does is it serves the same uh, function, right? It shows people who is, uh, it, it shows people whether or not you're up to speed. So I think you're all quite right. We're gonna try as much as we can to eliminate noise uh, in our writing. And there are some things we can do. Oops, okay. And again, I just wanna stress about uh, your audience, right? M make sure that you are keeping your, your relationship to your audience in mind. Uh, if, you're, if you're speaking to a peer, uh, who, that will, that will uh, be entirely different than if you're speaking to your boss or if you're speaking to a stranger or, and someone you don't really know, but someone who you'd like to maybe have a, a business relationship with, then you want to have that in mind as well. What is their background knowledge? What is their attitude toward the topic? What do they know about you? Okay, so how do we overcome these obstacles? How do we overcome uh, the noise that we've just been discussing and many of you have so kindly put in the chat? Well, we have to rely on persuasive writing. And I've got a, a picture here of, of, of Aristotle. And, uh, and I do that because Ar Aristotle is one of the big thinkers when it comes to the term of rhetoric. And honestly, we haven't improved very much on the ancient Greeks and, and their understanding of persuasion in the, in the thousands of years that uh, have occurred since they uh, were uh, alive and kicking, right? So what we're gonna talk about for the next couple of minutes is just rhetoric. Uh, what is rhetoric? So I'll put the, I'll put the question to you in the, uh, in the chat or, or over, um, uh, you can speak orally as well. How, how do you understand rhetoric? What, what, what does rhetoric mean? Hi, Barb. Good to see another Torontonian. Debate, arguments. Nonsense, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, rhetoric has kind of a bad uh, name, right? It has kind of a negative connotation these days because it's associated with, um, like, like you say, Deborah, insincerity. It's associated with politics. But in its very essence, right, rhetoric is, is far removed from those things. It is... Uh, very broadly, it is just the re rhetoric is comes from the uh, Latin word rhetor, which means speaker. So it just means the art of communicating effectively. So rhetoric is just um, the art of persuasion, right? Often rhetoric is uh, defined as being persuasive or being convincing, but it's not just that. It, it is any choice you make to be a more effective communicator. That is what falls under the umbrella of rhetoric. So here we have uh, Plato and Aristotle arguing, and they are arguing over perhaps the, the principles of, of, of rhetoric, right? So Aristotle discusses in his book, The Poetics, Ars Poetica, that he defines persuasion and how persuasion can be achieved. And in doing so, he talks about the three rhetorical appeals. So he says, persuasion is achieved by the speaker's personal character when the speech is so spoken as to make us think him credible. Secondly, Persuasion may come through the hearers when the speech stirs their emotions. Thirdly, persuasion is affected through the speech itself when we have proved a truth or an apparent truth by means of the persuasive arguments suitable to the case in question. Right, so I'm sorry for reading the slide, but uh, I just wanted to get that out because that is what persuasion is. Persuasion comes down to three appeals. So Aristotle says, and uh, many agree with him, that when you're trying to be persuasive, you can appeal to three things. Logos, ethos, and pathos. We can appeal to our audience's sense of reason. What is logical? What is uh, reasonable, right? Uh, we can appeal to our authority, that is ethos. That is when we try to make ourselves more credible. Or we can appeal to our audience's emotions, right? And that, that one is very effective, but maybe a bit fraught, right? So just to go through them again, Logos, right? Anytime you make an argument based on facts, evidence, reason, statistics, ex examples, concrete examples, that is when you're using logos. You're appealing to the reader's sense of what is logical. So logos is almost always good, right? Logos is almost always a, uh, uh, you know, 
Logos is almost always an effective means of, of supporting your argument. But is there a, a downside to Logos? Is there a way Logos can, can go wrong? What do you think? Right, I think a lot of you in the chat are, uh, are, are quite right. It's, it's cerebral, it's bloodless, it, it can be a bit cold, right? It's dry. So Logos is almost always good. It's almost always effective. But if your uh, text, if your essay, if your article, if your report, if it is all Logos, that's gonna present an issue because it's just a bit too dry, right? So you want to intersperse it with the other appeals. Like Franzia says, you can bore with details, right? It's, it's possible to be too detail oriented. It's possible to be too logical, right? It's, I know it's hard to believe, but it, it is. Okay, so what about ethos? Ethos is the argument from authority. That is when the writer or speaker presents him or herself to the reader as credible, right? Anytime you want to enhance the credibility of yourself of, as a speaker, that is when you deploy ethos the ethical appeal it's called. So at the very beginning of our workshop today, I, you know, I, you know, I let slip and, and people introduced me as I have a PhD in English and I've taught writing for, for 10 years. Uh, why did I do that? Not just because uh, my mom is very proud of me about that. It's because I was trying in ever so, ever so subtle, maybe not so subtle way to suggest to you that I know a little bit about what I'm talking about, that I've done this a while, that I have the cre necessary credentials. And so I, in, in a sense, I was hoping you would take me a little bit more seriously because you don't, you probably don't know me from Adam. You don't know me at all, but you now that you've heard maybe, Oh, that I have a little bit of this background that you might, you might sit up in your chair and pay attention a little bit more. Right? So there are lo lots of things can fall under the ethos uh, umbrella, the ethical appeal umbrella, which is like any, you know, if you are using your power position as a boss, that is, that can be the ethos appeal, but also, Anytime you like point to your credentials, you point to your education, but also it could be any the ways the choices you make to present a nice document. Things like having um, writing it very well, not having any grammar or spelling mistakes, formatting it exactly according to disciplinary conventions. All those things are ethos, right? If you got two resumes and one was uh, you know typed up very nice, nicely formatted, and you got another uh, resume that was written on the back of a pizza box and tomato sauce, right? you would probably pick the one that was well formatted, even if they were identical, because that is ethos. One just has more authority, has more credibility. So ethos can be an effective uh, type of, uh, exactly, uh, ethos can be an effective type of, um, of appeal, uh, but it, it too might have a downside. Can you think of any possibilities where ethos might go wrong, where ethos might be a, uh, the wrong move? Right, Rosalia says you might appear vain, potentially uh, diminishing the audience, might be pretentious, right? I think, you know, uh, Lorraine points out that I said that I'm, yeah, yes, I am a doctor, uh, but uh, call me Zach. And that's all people with PhDs want to do, by the way. There, there's a stereotype that people with PhDs demand that you call them doctor, but really they want you to call them doctor once. So you can say, please call me Zach. And then you seem so humble and you seem so modest, uh, but, but really it's just another form of, uh, of, of ego, right? Maybe it comes across as too arrogant, that's, 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 that's a possibility. And also I'm sure you've heard the expression, right? A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still, right? That means that if you use your power to make someone do something, they haven't necessarily changed their opinion. They've just been obliged or compelled to do it. Right? It's, it's not really good uh, management, right? And I think what Catherine writes is quite right, that ethos can be misplaced, right? Uh, just because you're an expert in something doesn't mean you're an expert in everything. We've seen it a million times where people who are very effective at certain jobs. They're experts in some field and they think that expertise grants them carte blanche to talk about any, any fields, right? But it doesn't quite work that way. And um, I, I think I probably don't have to tell you that just because someone has impressive credentials doesn't mean they are right about everything, right? So it, you can't rest your argument entirely on ethos, right? I think you've probably seen those ads from the 60s where it's like, I'm a doctor and I smoke four packs of Camel a day and I recommend it, right? That person was a medical expert, but they were wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, so and, and take, take it from me, someone who you know, has a PhD and has been to grad school, it's, the, the, it's not always the smartest people who are there, I have to confess, right? Um, 
so uh, I think that is something to keep in mind that ethos can't be the backbone of your argument. You, but in the right moments, you can totally do it. Right? I think of a particular instance from the Super Bowl a couple of years ago where Dodge showed this um, commercial and they had a speech uh, by Martin Luther King. Uh, I, I thought of it because it was Martin Luther King Day last week. And uh, they, they were showing all the, you know, they were showing Dodge Ram and they, and they, were, and they were showing all these different things. And then over the, the commercial, we, there was a kind of very moving speech by Martin Luther King. And uh, pretty obviously Dodge was trying to borrow a little bit of credibility from Dr. Martin Luther King, who is like one of the most, you know, credible people. He, he has a very high approval rating among most people. Uh, and so they were trying to, in a sense, and I'm sure they cleared the speech and paid the family, but uh, in a sense, they were trying to borrow his credibility, but it, it was completely criticized and, and completely fell, um, you know, it, it, it was a total dud on the Super Bowl and people hated it simply because there is a disconnect between trying to borrow a speech by Martin Luther King about civil rights and applying it to a truck, right? It, there were, it didn't work, right? So that is the danger of ethos is that you wanna be pretty careful with how you deploy your credibility and someone else's. And then the last one is pathos, the argument based on feelings. And pathos means appealing to the reader's emotions and 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 and, and their sense of um, feeling. So you're kind of circumventing the um, you're trying to circumvent the brain, or trying to go 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 over the head of the brain and get right to the heart of of, of your audience. And this can be very effective. I'm sure, like when you, we could still go to movies or you're watching TV. I'm sure. Have you ever been in the position like I have, where you find yourself crying <laughs> at a commercial? You're like. Gosh darn you, Coca-Cola, you've done it again. <laughs> how, how can you do this to me? I, I didn't expect to cry today. Uh, that is pathos, right? That is the pathetic appeal and it can be very potent. It can be very powerful, but there's a downside to pathos too. What is the, um, is, I'll, I'll post the, the slide again, sorry, Fab. Uh, what, is the, um, what is the downside to, uh, to pathos? What's the downside to the emotional appeal, do you think? Deborah says you feel guilt, you feel obliged. Yeah, it, it, it could be sappy. Uh, and I think your know, Rose Lilia is right that it is manipulative. It, it, it just is, right? And so uh, it, it's possible to overshoot your mark, right? It's possible to try to go for an emotional appeal, but then it doesn't quite work, right? Because people don't like to have their heartstrings tugged too hard. It can be something um, a little bit it can be, you know, it can be nice, it can be cathartic to, to feel an emotion when you're reading something or you're watching something, but it too can be difficult, right? Um, it too can feel like too much, laying it on too thick. And I think uh, Everett is quite right that um, people not, are going to interpret different emotional things differently. It's not something that, it's not like a fact that it tends to be uh, interpreted at, by every, you know, the same by everyone, hopefully anyway, but it can feel false. So uh, yeah, things like humor, things like uh, pathos, they can work really well, but you have to be super, super careful. So pathos is the argument based on feelings, appealing to the reader's emotions. So I, I really like the, the old show, uh, Mad Men, and at, in the season finale of, of season one, Don Draper in, in his character, he, he gives a, a pitch for Kodak and th th they call it a, 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 um, a wheel the, the Kodak slide projector, which some of you might have had if you're if you're if you might might have seen if you're older, uh, and he, he changes it to a carousel and connects it very potently to the emotion of nostalgia. And so when he, what he's able to do is associate that product with an emotion, and it works super well. However, it can go wrong very fast. Right? I remember another Super Bowl uh, nationwide had a commercial called "Make Safe Happen," and it was a very whimsical commercial that that showed. Uh, this young boy running around and having fun and then it turns into a commercial about children dying in accidents right and it was just you know imagine you're on the couch you're eating your cheetos you're drinking your beer you're watching the game and then this happens and uh, people just wrote in to nationwide at, 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 at such an impressive clip that the ceo of the insurance company had to uh had to issue an apology so all this to say emotions can be very effective they can be a very um, effective strategy for persuading your audience, 
but you have to be very, very careful with them. So what good writers do is they use all these appeals, not equally, but in proportion. Logos should, should win the day. Logos should predominate. With a little bit of ethos, you want to make yourself seem as credible as possible without seeming arrogant, of course. And then when the moment is exactly right, when the moment is just perfect, that's when you deploy emotion, the pathos appeal. And Zach, um, yeah. there's a question about humor. I mean, you s s um, where does humor come into this and how, how can it be used? Right, well, I think uh, humor can be, you know, uh, I'm reminded of the, um, the quote by uh, uh, E.B. White where he says, discussing uh, humor is kind of like um, dissecting a frog. Uh, no one likes it and the frog is dead, right? So, uh, the same is true uh, of humor, but in certain contexts, humor can work really well, right? It can be totally effective, uh, but it really depends on if you're picking your moment. It, I, I would, everything I said about pathos, I would say for humor, right? Is that in the, in the right context, humor can be uh, a, 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 an effective uh, arrow to have in your quiver to deploy, to be more persuasive, to, to, to use a little bit of irony, to use a little bit of satire. It can work really well, but like everything else, not everyone will interpret it the same. Um, and, uh, and furthermore, uh, the, um, the, uh, it could be completely in, 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 inappropriate in some cases, right? Uh, if, if, if we're having, a, if you're having a very serious discussion where, 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 where people, you know, people's lives are at stake, people's uh, livelihoods are at stake, maybe now's not the time for the joke. And like Lorraine says, yeah, cultural sensitivity important as well, right? So uh, people are asking me to put up the, um, the pathos slide. I'm hoping I can get you the whole uh, slideshow uh, after the, uh, the presentation, but here it is. All it says is argument based on feelings and using pathos means appealing to readers' emotions and feelings. So let's go to our, our, our second activity. If you take a look at the handout, take a look at uh, activity two. And uh, let's just read it together for a moment. And then we will um, discuss how it can be improved. So let's take a look here. So this person is sending an email to, to four people. It's, it's coming from someone called Precarious Pete. And the subject line is a favor. And there is a 12 megabyte uh, attachment to the email as well. He says, hey guys, I hope everyone is well. It was good to see you all at Melissa's party on Friday night. How was the rest of your weekend? Anyway, Dave asked me to write an action plan for the new year with a list of objectives the department should strive to meet. I really do want to do a good job. So I was wondering if one of you could read it over for me. I would really appreciate it. My contract is up at the end of the year and I really hope to stay on here. I have student loans. Let me know what you think. Sincerely, Precarious Pete. Okay, so take a look at this email on the screen and uh, also in your handout if you want and look for possible red flags. What are the red flags that are, are kind of ensuring that Pete here is not going to get his favor done for him? So just put it in the chat and we'll talk about it in a minute. So let's reconvene in one minute and we can talk about this email uh, furthermore. Yes, please feel free to put in the chat everything you find uh, somewhat suspect or a little bit of a red flag for, uh, for, for, this, for this, uh, this email. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of good responses in the uh, in the uh, in the chat, and I think uh, a lot of you are, um, are 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 talking about the, uh, the the exact right things. So let's just go through the email uh, together, and, uh, and 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 I think we'll we'll see what the problem is here. So first of all, we can start at the top, right? The 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 the, <laughs> the four people it's addressed to, 
What's the issue with addressing it to four people here? Why could that be a possible problem? Deborah? Oh, um, maybe uh, everyone may assume that someone else will take care of it or reply to it. Um, it yeah. Doesn't give them any accountability. Precisely, right? Like Linda says in, in the chat, diffusion of responsibility. Imagine yeah. you got this email, it was, it was sent to four of you. It, you would, person number one would think four would do it, four would think two would do it, three would think one, and ultimately no one would end up doing it. Plus, it's a little bit insulting, you know, I have a problem that only you and maybe three or four other people can help me with, right? So you want to increase the exclusivity. It, even if you're sending the same message, it doesn't take a lot of effort to copy and paste uh, emails. So, uh, you know, do your best to personalize and make it exclusive. And then we've got the subject line, a favor. Imagine if you got this, the email that said, so, a, a favor? Like, oh no, oh, you, you would definitely not want to open that. Uh, you're already kind of on, a, um, on, on your back heel, right? So you know, when it comes to doing favors, I think there's the impression that um, some people, that people don't like to do favors or that favors are, are a burden. Whereas the truth is, uh, people actually really love to do favors. All the studies show that people love doing favors because it makes them feel good. But people only love to do favors if two criteria are met. And the two criteria that need to be met are, um, what? What do you think? <clears throat> the two criteria that people need to meet in order for a, a favor to be completed is it needs to, one, in some way serve their self-interest. So it seems, it seems a little bit callous, it seems a little bit cynical, but it's just the, the way it is. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. There needs to be some kind of, there needs to be something a little bit in it for them, even if it's just the, the, the doing of a good uh, deed. Furthermore, the, um, exactly as Fab says, what's in it for them. And the other criteria that people need to meet if they want a favor to be done is it needs to be easy. You need to really bring the, the ball right up to the hole for them. So as long as it's in, in their self-interest in some way and it's doable, that is, uh, you, you're, you're doing a good job of, um, of, of putting yourself in a good position for them to do the favor. So I think Pete in his email does not do that at all. And we've got a, a massive attachment. Uh, you're not going to want to open that right away and certainly not on your phone over data. You start with the, hey, guys, maybe a bit too informal, right? I, I think there are probably some company cultures were saying, hey, guys, is, is, is okay. But I think it, it's maybe a little bit of an issue. I hope everyone is well. It was good to see you all at Melissa's party on Friday. Now, uh, there is some controversy about when you're being persuasive, whether or not a, um, a pleasantry is okay. Hope you're well. Hope your weekend was going well. And I think, actually, the studies show that people either appreciate a pleasantry or they don't care. So you're not really doing, not too many people get too annoyed when there's a short pleasantry at the beginning of a message. But I think that what Pete does is he makes a crucial error, which is asking the question. So when that person responds to the email, they'll be like, oh, do I have to respond to this question? Do I have to talk about the rest of my weekend? Or do I just get straight to the, uh, to, to, to the, to the, the favor? And then we have the anyway, right? It's kind of a, a a record scratch moment is like everything else doesn't matter. We're just getting down to what what what, what matters to me now, and then we have this. I uh, you know he, he kind of asks for I guess feedback on his uh, action plan, but he never really outright asks it. It's just kind of um, kind, kind of implied. I would really appreciate it. And um, look at the beginning of every sentence here. I I I was wondering my contracts. I have student loans. The pronoun I completely dominates this second paragraph, which indicates just from the grammar and the diction that in the pronoun use, that the only person who really is important in this is, is Pete. Right? So we also have the, the problem here with I have student loans. That's obviously uh, Pete trying to use pathos a little bit, but uh, you know, pity doesn't pay, as they say, a, a, little bit too, a little bit too on the nose. So what I want to encourage you, when you're trying to be persuasive, you want to take what's called the you view, which is to say, if there's a way you can write a sentence without, uh, where instead of saying I, you use the pronoun you, that would be, um, that, that, is, that has been proven to be more effective, proven to be more persuasive, right? 
So instead of saying, I need this right now, <laughs> say something like, as soon as you provide the material, you can get started. So, the, so people are very, you know, very, very vain in that way, is they like to, um, they, they, they want to kind of feel implicated in the text. All right. So what, what are some things we can, uh, what, what's some advice we can give to Pete? I see lots of uh, great, uh, you know, great ideas in, in, the, um, in, in the chat. So I've, I've got a couple of um, tips I would give Pete if, I, if we were to improve this email. First and foremost, write a clear and specific subject line, right? Not a favor, always write something. Now, subject lines are, are, are very hard to, to, to write because they're so repetitive. But you, you know, I think probably in, in terms of email that it is, um, you know, email is kind of a big filing folder for us, a big, a big uh, a, a place where we save things. So you have to make it searchable. So including being as specific as possible is really helpful. And what I have found is what you want to do in your subject lines and titles of any kind really is to go from heart to brain, right? So what I usually do if I'm writing an important email is I will try to, as best I can, in the first word of the subject line, strike to the audience's heart a little bit, go to their emotion. Now that, that doesn't mean being saccharine or being sappy, it just means uh, appealing to something beyond the intellectual capacity. So you might say something like urgent, deadline, uh, you know, um, or, or you might just have anything that kind of connects the, the reader to, to, the, to, to the text, right? Quick question. Uh, feedback needed, whatever it might be. And then you have a colon, then you have a piece of punctuation like a colon, and then you have the brain. So you might have something like quick question, colon, action plan 2021, right? So, so it, it gives you, uh, it, it makes it searchable, it makes it specific, and it connects with the reader's emotions as well as their intellect. Uh, one thing that, uh, tip that works really well is to think about when you are sending the message. Uh, studies show that when you send emails at certain peak times, you're more likely to get a response. So Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays between 2 and 5 p.m., those get more responses than any other time. So you want to think about it, right? Maybe don't send it Sunday night. Don't send it, you know, Christmas Eve. You, you want to think about when you're sending it and, and when you might uh, reasonably receive a response. And apparently, studies show that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday between 2 and 5 is the best time. I think that's because people on Monday, they've been thinking about work all weekend and they, they wanna get started on some long-term projects. No one really works that hard on Friday. So these are the times to send your, your email if you have to ask for a favor. Cut the small talk, like you were saying. Uh, you know, Try not to be rude, but uh, you, you, can, you can have a pleasantry, but the best thing to do would be probably dispense with it pretty quickly. Put only one name in the two fields, as we were just discussing, right? For every name you add, you're losing about 5% of a response rate. And by the time you've added nine people, it's unlikely that you will get any response whatsoever. Uh, believe it or not, it might seem presumptuous to do this and it might seem a, a tad rude, but if you give your correspondent a deadline, they actually really appreciate it, right? Just give them, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a, a overly uh, strict or totalitarian deadline, but if you could suggest a deadline, uh, it's actually a kindness to your reader. It seems rude, but they, but uh, your correspondent will actually appreciate it because it will give them a time frame where they can think about what they're going to do. If you leave a request open ended or 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 don't uh, say when it is um, when it's time sensitive, uh, it's going to stay on the person's to do list forever, right? They're just never going to get to it because because they don't know if it, 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 in in their minds it's not late at all. Remember the smartphone, right? Most people are going to be re re receiving the message on a smartphone which means that um, you, know, you want to avoid tables, pictures a little bit, keep it brief and don't have massive uh, attachments. Like I said a moment ago, remember the you view. Instead of saying it's important I receive an answer ASAP, as soon as you respond, you can get started. If you can change your I to a you, it will, get, it's more, it will be more likely to get a response. It'll be received much better. And end with a question. This is, this, is a, this is a weird thing, but even if it's a question like, is that okay? Or does that sound good to you? Whenever there's a question that compels a response, right? So Pete in his email asks for help, but he never quite asks a question, does he? Uh, and so there's nothing really to respond to. Whereas if you end with a question, it would it, like, is this something you wanna be a part of? Do you wanna get involved in this? 
it, it, it compels a response. So readers, it's been proven, they will respond, they're much more likely to respond to messages that have a question, that end with a question. So here's my revision of what I would do if I, if I were Pete. Uh, so <clears throat> we're sending it to one person. Our subject now is quick question, action plan. And we've changed the attachment to an executive summary rather than a full, uh, a full attachment that, with, with a massive file. So I say, dear Mr. Admin, Dave has entrusted me to write an action plan outlining a list of objectives for the department this year. Given your experience, I think your perspective could be valuable in crafting a list of ambitious but realistic goals that we can work towards. In previous years, your department has been underrepresented in the action plan, which is something I hope to correct. Please find attached an executive summary that outlines the broader goals of the project. If you want your input to be included in my report, please let me know by Friday at 5 p.m. Does that work for you? Sincerely, Peter. All right. So we've gone from Pete to Peter. We are we have crafted a much more effective email, I think, which um, which uh, in, implicates Dave or, or whoever we're writing to uh, the admin to um, in, in the action plan themselves. So they feel compelled to get involved. It, it, it should, they are self-interested and we avoid the big red flags that we had in the previous one. Now in that email that I showed you earlier, I think it's probably unlikely that all those red flags appear, but like be honest with yourself and think about how many messages you've sent where at least one of them are there, right? And it does happen. So yes, I think Lorraine is quite right to, to treat the reader as intelligent, to, um, to, uh, you know, to, 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 to really um, be vigorous and, and go through your emails with, with a fine tooth uh, comb. So does anyone have any com comments or, or anything like that before we move on to the next section? I know I'm going really fast because we want to, I want to include so much stuff, but uh, if anyone has a question on their mind right now, I'd be happy to answer it. Yeah, I think I'm just looking at the comments in the chat. Everyone is, everyone, everyone is great in the, uh, So I'm going to find a way to share the slides with you. I'll, I'll send them to, uh, to SES Cats and they'll be able to, to post the slides, I think. Okay. So how else can we craft uh, persuasive arguments? So, um, you know, we, we've kind of been focusing a little bit maybe on emails, uh, just, just because I think that that's something that's uh, relatable that everyone does on a day-to-day -day basis, whereas maybe not everyone is writing essays or, or, or articles or reports. But all the, everything we've been talking about applies. But another thing that, can, another strategy I'd like to bring your attention to to create um, um, to crafting a persuasive arguments means that we think about writing as kind of a, a, a series of moves, right? Um, many of you, maybe you played sports uh, growing up or, or, you, uh, you, or you danced and you, you go through that process and you do the same things over and over and over again that have become like second nature and you don't even think you're doing them. And the same is true of writing. The more you write persuasively, the more the kind of uh, templates and structures of, of persuasive writing re will reveal themselves uh, to you. And one strategy that works really well for me is called they say, I say. Now I teach at the McGill Writing Center and uh, when, when you're a writing teacher, you get sent a lot of uh, books, sometimes free books even, but uh, it's never the books I want, right? N never beautiful novels, usually it's uh, grammar handbooks and, 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 and composition textbooks. But one book that I, that I got that I really liked and I think you can get it from the library and uh, it's, it's widely available online, is basically I say the moves that matter in academic writing by Graf and Birkenstein. And these are, what they do is they go through a series of moves that show you how to make your writing a bit more persuasive. Try to enter into a conversation rather than just putting forth arguments that are like in a vacuum that just come from a primordial ooze. So they say I say in my opinion and in the opinion of lots, is uh, an effective strategy for persuasive writing. So think about it this way, right? Whenever you're trying to be persuasive, whenever you are um, trying to make a point or change a system, change a workflow, whatever it is you're doing, you are, um, in a, you, you are, you are, you are crafting an argument, right? You're, you're putting forth an argument. But the question is, in real life, whenever we actually have an argument, it's usually in response to something. Usually it is someone is wrong, someone has said something stupid and you have to interject, you have to tell them uh, what you, um, what's on your mind. So it's rare that arguments just come out of nowhere, um, you know, come, come emerge from a vacuum, emerge fully formed like Athena from Zeus's head. No, 
um, usually arguments are in response. They're, they're, someone says something that challenges us and we respond. Otherwise, there's no reason to argue. So when you're crafting a persuasive argument, what you want to do is give yourself someone to argue with, right? Give yourself the vital pretense, give yourself the excuse to argue. So that's what they say, I say allows us to do. So essentially you want to avoid, you want to write the voices of others into your own text. This is the, this is the goal of the they say, I say technique. You want to enter a conversation uh, before you put forth your argument using what others have said or what they might say as a, as a launching pad or sounding board for your own ideas. So what you wanna do is use other arguments or, or arguments that you think might be plausible as a launching pad, as the terrain upon which you can level your own argument, you can make your own critique. So in the real world, right, you don't just say arguments out of nowhere. You know, you don't, you, you know, you don't just stop someone on the street and say, I don't like the Habs, right? I, or I hate hockey. Usually someone says, I love the Habs. And you say, I can't see why you like the Habs so much, right? So we want, but when we get to business and we get to school, we end up forgetting that. So you want to make statements that are logical, well-supported, consistent, but also enter into a conversation with others, with something that they say. So before you say your piece, before you say the I say part of your argument, before you say your argument or your thesis, you want to preface it with something that someone else has said. This provides context for your argument and it grounds it in, the re in reality. It's not, an ob it's not an abstract argument. It is something that is concrete. So let's think about it this way. Let's take something truly controversial like Hawaiian pizza. So in, in the chat, uh, you know, who, whom among you uh, really loves Hawaiian pizza? Who loves Hawaiian pizza here? Some people love it. Who hates it? Yuck. Right. Controversial, right? Does anyone, does anyone know where Hawaiian pizza was invented? Not Hawaii, but in Canada by a, a, a Greek immigrant to Canada. Exactly, Catherine, thank you. So <laughs> pineapple is for drinks with umbrellas. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, Ro Rosina says yuck. So that is what we will use as our they say. Although Rosina Felice insists that Hawaiian pizza is yuck. In fact, Hawaiian pizza is the perfect combination of sweet and savory and makes for an excellent pizza topic. So that's so much more effective than just saying, I don't like Hawaiian pizza. Like despite what, um, you know, despite what Fab might think, Hawaiian pizza is actually quite excellent. And you can do it the other way around too, right? You could say, although Lisa Kanako loves Hawaiian pizza, she in fact is egregiously incorrect and could not be more incorrect because the, you know, Fruit should not be on pizza at all, right? Something along those lines, right? So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that when you're crafting persuasive arguments, you can put forth your argument. Yes, that's fine. But it will be so much more persuasive if you can connect that argument to your counter argument. Right? So you per, it, it can feel uh, somewhat counterintuitive, right? It can feel like, well, maybe I shouldn't bring up the opposing side. Maybe I shouldn't concede to them anything. But it actually really, works for you because you will be putting forth an argument that is grounded in reality. There's some, there's a reason to argue. There's, a, there's an excuse for you to make this case. You're not just randomly shouting about Hawaiian pizza. No, someone has said something wrong and you have to correct them. You have to uh, nuance, you have to disrupt a, 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 a consensus. You have to add a shade of gray to this conversation. Okay? So that's what I would recommend is whenever you're making a, an argument, don't let that argument just be in the ether, don't let it just emerge from a vacuum, connect it to the disagreement. And you include others in the conversation and, not, and, and when it's something more serious than Hawaiian pizza, you, when you do this, you're proving, what are you proving? You're proving that the conversation about this topic is significant, relevant, important, and it has to happen. And who better than to contribute to it than me, since I already know so much about it. And so that's our goal is we want, this is the, we're, we're rolling the ethos, logos and pathos appeal all into one to make a, a strong argument that is connected to what others have said or what they might say. And you can't lie, of course, but you can probably create a person to whom you can argue against. 
if you're like me, you lay awake at night just thinking of people who are wrong that you can disagree with. Uh, and then you, and you have a great argument with them in the shower and you start your day. But it, it can be, uh, and you can be, and, and like Deborah says in, in, in the chat, it shows that you've taken the whole issue seriously and you've considered every option and you've come to your own conclusion. Okay, we, we, we are running out of time. Well, let me see if there's one last thing I can do here. Okay, let's do, let, we've, got, we've probably got enough time just to do our last activity. Uh, and then I'll, then I'll take some, some questions. Uh, <clears throat> so take a look at, sorry, that should be example number three. So you take a look at this example number three. So, you know, uh, it, it's easy to ask favors uh, and, and try to inspire action in people we know. What if we're emailing someone we don't know? What if we're emailing a stranger? So here, this email is emailing students trying to get them to complete their course evaluations at McGill. So let's see, dear students, you've made it to the end of the semester, woohoo! Friday is the last day to complete your course evaluations. You have until midnight tomorrow. So before you move on to your summer plans, please take a few minutes to provide your instructors and the university with important feedback. Complete your course evaluations here. Please address any questions, comments, and feedback to this email address. Sincerely, uh, McGill Admin. So, this isn't the worst email that's ever been written, right? It's, it's not too bad, but I, but <clears throat> be honest, if you were a student at McGill, which many of you are, uh, would you re respond to that? <laughs> w would you do what they say? You might if you were in the mood, but it would be difficult, right? As uh, Rosina says, it's not, there's, there's not a lot of um, buy-in. What is, what is in it for them? What are they getting out of it? They're just supposed to do it because it has to be done, right? So we want to, what, what do we have to do here? Well, we have to increase the persuasion and the persuasive elements by about 10%. Got to point out how, what, we got to make it valuable to them and that it might affect change. It might be, have some kind of uh, important impact on their lives. So one strategy that I think works really well for, um, for uh, messages like this is there is a classic strategy that writers rely on for, for this kind of thing and it's called the AIDA structure, <laughs> AIDA. So whenever you're trying to convince someone of something, especially if you don't know them and you can't rely on your personal relationship, you wanna go AIDA. Get their attention, create interest, build desire and urge action. Attention, interest, desire and action. This is what the AIDA structure can do for us. So to get attention in the beginning of our message, in the beginning of our text, we want to hook them, we wanna get a hook. We want to get their attention. What can we use as a hook? Well, we could use lots of things. Quotes, anecdotes, questions, facts, definitions, experience, you know, a startling statistic. <clears throat> All those things could serve as a pretty good hook, I think. But it depends on the situation. You know what's best to do, I think. Uh, and then you want to create interest. And like you've been saying in the chat, identify the reader's needs and what you can do to help them. Be succinct, use bullet points, right? implore them, show them that it is in their interest to complete the task you want them to complete. Build desire. And in this case, details sell, right? The more concrete you can be, the more specific you can be as you build desire, whether it's through statistics or testimonials or some kind of deal <clears throat> that you can uh, back up with numbers, that will build desire and it will, and it will increase the likelihood that they will do what you, what you want them to do. It'll be more persuasive. And then inspire action. Confidently ask for the, co for the cooperation, emphasize the positive results of their action, make it clear and easy, make sure they know the due date, <clears throat> and uh, avoid negative statements. This is something that's uh, easy to do in messages like this. Try to be positive, make sure that you're writing always in the imperative to make your contribution, right? and then link the final sentence with the message and the statement from the introduction. All right? so. Uh, to revise the email that we just read, th this is my idea, and we can, I can get your thoughts on it in, in a moment. So th this is how I think maybe I would write it. Dear students, another semester at McGill has come to a close, which means your professors will be hunkering down at their desks to grade your final exams as paper and papers. As the old adage goes, however, turnabout is fair play. Don't miss your chance to turn the tables on your professor. The benefits to filling out your course evaluations are many. Instructors use feedback from previous courses to improve the teaching. Future students can view the course evaluations. Department chairs and, di and directors have full access to the results, including the comments. This process is vital and only takes a few minutes. Complete your Mercury course evaluations by clicking here. The deadline to complete your evaluation is this Friday at midnight. If you have any questions, please email mercury.info at mcgill.edu. 
www.ca. All right, so we've created a little bit of a cheeky self-interest for them, is that while it's true their professors can grade them, well, they too can grade their professors. So I think that's uh, effective, right? It's an effective uh, st structure. Think about AIDA, right? And you can do it in any <clears throat> in anything, right? You can, um, it, no matter what the message is, whether it's very persuasive or not, get their attention, increase the interest, build the desire, and then at the end, try your best to spur on the action. Okay, so we have got five minutes left in our uh, workshop. You, you guys have been amazing. The, the, the uh, comments in the chat, I've been kind of been keeping one eye on them and they've been dead on pretty much the entire uh, workshop. Um, and I'm sorry if I haven't responded to all of them, but there have been so many that they've been just, just been flying by. So um, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'm hoping you'll be able to, to get your hands on the um, on the slideshow so you, so you can review that. And on that slideshow will also be my email address. So if there's any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to email me. I don't mind. Uh, and I can certainly help you get in touch with um, the, uh, the McGill Writing Center, which offers a variety of services. Which you, so I, I, would, I would like it if you could uh, take a look at the McGill Writing Center website. There's lots of stuff that, that you might find uh, valuable. So does anyone have any, uh, any questions in the last minute? I was wondering about adapting it to PowerPoints, reports, all kinds of things. Do, do you have to think about diff different aspects depending on what kind of document you're writing? Certainly the, the, the conventions of uh, each genre will, will dictate a little bit uh, what you write, but I think the, the broad strokes of, uh, you know, of e logos, ethos, and pathos, of, uh, of AIDA, those things can apply in, in, in pretty much any scenario, right? Uh, there are lots of specific e examples of, uh, that, 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 that can be pointed to of, of, of structures, but they all kind of have the similar thing, right? Which is that you have to interweave all these strategies uh, at the appropriate uh, moment. So yeah, I think you should be a little bit concerned about like what is the context, what is the, what is the genre in which you're you're writing. A presentation is not uh, a an email, but uh, they, they're they're more similar than they are um, different. They're just they're just different mediums of communication. And thankfully, in a presentation, even when on Zoom, you can exploit uh, body language and, and vocal inflection a, a little bit. Um, I'm seeing so. Let's let me see. So Maria is asking if, if they can apply to a book. Well, it, it depends on what kind of book. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how to respond to that. Let me see. Uh, okay. So uh, Fab asked a good question, which is if you don't receive any replies from when you're asking for a favor, uh, what, you, what do you do? This is why you include the deadline. Because after the deadline has passed, you have an, an excuse to follow up politely, of course, right? Uh, if you don't include the deadline, then it can feel a little bit pushy. But if you've included the deadline and you've gotten no response, then I think it's completely appropriate <clears throat> to, to follow up. Now, it depends on your relationship with the person, right? If this is someone who's in your office and, and you know them, uh, I think it's, it's perfectly okay to follow up a couple times even. If, however, it's someone you don't know, they might very well just be sending you the signal that they they're, they're saying no with, with, with their silence and, and perhaps we have to just respect that. But at least when we, have, when we, when we do the, the deadline strategy, we have, an, we have a built-in excuse uh, to follow up. The little characters on my bookshelf. Oh, I've got characters from uh, my neighbor Totoro and Tintin, my, my, my childhood hero. During reaching out, if you have this, so if you have multiple questions or requests on different topics of the same person. Yeah, this is a difficult one, right? Where you have lots of different uh, questions you want to ask the same person. And I tend to, you know, it doesn't always have to be this way. Sometimes we can't avoid it, but I tend to advise, try to keep each message or email one topic per email, right? One idea per email. Uh, it, it depends, especially if you're asking for a favor. I mean, th there are some cases where like you're, you're working with a peer or your boss or, or someone who is under you. And it's, I think in that case, it's acceptable to kind of put, you know, okay, this is gonna be a long email, I'm sorry, but we're, we're, we're dealing with these four things. But if it's a, a persuasive document, it's gonna get lost in the, in, in the mix, right? So you want to, as much as possible, keep uh, with one idea per, um, per, um, per email. 
So yeah, thanks very much. I'm sorry I haven't been able to get to um, all the questions in the chat, but if you um, would like to follow up with me, uh, my email can be found and, uh, and I'd be happy to respond. Uh, but you know, I, I can't believe that you were uh, so attentive and, and, and there were so many of you on, on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, so thank you uh, so much for your participation. I, I'm, uh, I, I'm really impressed. And, and if, if, if you're ever at McGill again and you happen to see me on campus, please don't hesitate uh, to say hi. I, I'd love to, I would love to chat and maybe we'll be maskless by then and you'll be able to see. But if not, this is what I look like from, from, from my eye up, all right? And then, uh, so thanks very much. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, see you soon. Have a great weekend. Yeah, and yeah, so thank you so much, Zach, for uh, the very dynamic and uh, exampleful, concrete presentation. Uh, you gave us so many tips to demystify per persuasive writing and, you know, so many things that we can concretely think about now, you know, where about pathos and uh, logos and ethos. So thank you, thank you so much for this very informative presentation. Um, today's the last day of power skills and um, I'll leave it to Diana to just uh, say the last few words about that. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, your presentation, Zach. Thank you. Thank you, Iris, and thank you, Zach, and thank you all of you who are there and who have followed uh, this uh, summit throughout three days in a row. I'm so happy to see familiar faces now. Uh, we met new people all along these three days, and welcome to the School of Continuous Studies. Welcome to the CATS community. Um, we'll be uh, following up with you. Uh, we'll send out a survey um, on this session and all other sessions at Power Skills 2021 because we want to hear from you and receive your feedback. Your feedback is super important for us in order to improve. Uh, if uh, maybe you'll be wondering why uh, we include a donation button at the top of our website. Well, it is because the School of Continuing Studies is collecting support from its extended community. So if you can, if you want, uh, don't hesitate, pass by and donate. Thank you so much for your time, for your presence uh, throughout this summit. And I hope to see you soon in our next Power Skills Summit.